Hello everyone, my name is Cable, and today I'm presenting you the first episode of my new series, Game Design Lessons with Cable. Uh, so a little background about me, in case this is catching you a bit off guard, this is a lot different than the normal content that I do. I am actually a master student in a game design program right now, and I am the lead producer on an upcoming game called Kickshot 2, a sequel to Kickshot which is currently available on Steam. Uh, what I wanted to do with this series is kind of document my process as a game designer in this master's program. Um, going through all of the games that we'll be creating over the next couple of years, starting with the games that we started this past August called the Rapid Prototyping series. Rapid Prototyping is a class that we have to take where we'll be developing six or seven, we're not sure how many, games with small teams of about six to seven people over the course of two to three weeks and just documenting what we've done, what I've learned from each of these projects, and how each of them has gone. So each project follows a fairly similar style. First, we're given an inspiration and a restriction for the project. For this project, we played a white elephant game, which is a game where each player picks a mystery gift from a table, and you're allowed to unwrap the gift, or you're allowed to steal other people's gifts. Uh, and in this case, we were given 12 different objects for the 12 teams that were a toy that was supposed to inspire our gameplay. In our case, we got a toy ball which is a fairly open-ended inspiration. It's an inspiration that leaves a lot of ideas open for us. The restriction was a bit heavy-handed for the first project, however. We were only allowed to use Mono Game or Pi Game, both of which are fairly restrictive engines without a lot of meat to them. They allow you to do the basic things that a game engine provides, such as display sprites, play sounds, things like that, but nothing super impressive. The team that I was on consisted of two producers, including myself, two engineers, one artist, and one technical artist. And our ideas, we bounced around a couple, including a juggling game, some ideas about, you know, what else can you do with a ball that's not standard, and what we came up with in the end, against my better judgment, was a rotation-based maze-slash-platformer game. Now the idea was that you'd play as a ball who could rotate the world around them to gain momentum in either direction bounce off of little ramps, and platform your way up out of a maze, kind of like you were escaping from a black hole. Unfortunately, uh, we ran into a lot of problems over the development, which we'll get into when I talk about the postmortem. but first I'd like to show you some of the gameplay, and please be warned, I consider this game an abject failure in every sense of the word. This game is not fun, it's not good, it's not well made, but I'll play the footage here just so that you can see what exactly we did end up making. And as you can see, there are two controls. One speeds up the platform and one slows them down. What's counterintuitive is that going slower actually makes you jump higher. And yes, this is the frame rate that the game actually runs at. And yes, you do see that there are no ramps there. We couldn't get them to render. We experimented with a few different options and we found that the best way to do this and get the game out on time is just to do this system where you bounce off the platform after you go off the end, and you don't really need to see a lot of this gameplay footage to know that this game is not very fun, it's not very conducive to interesting gameplay. There's one strategy that seems to just dominate the entire game, which is to go slow when you're on the lower platforms and go fast when you're on the top, and the frame rate is just so, so bad. I, I don't even think it's worth going into any more of this, it is not a game that I'm proud of. Now, when we talk about the postmortem, I'm going to talk about what the development cycle is actually like, and break it down generally into five things that went right and five things that went wrong. Uh, unfortunately for this project though, nothing went right. From the get-go we were having issues with the design process where no one could agree on what they wanted to make, and we put it up to a vote. And unfortunately, you'll find if you get into game development that design by committee leads to some of the worst games ever made. This one included. Um, the idea was very ambitious, but it turned out that our programmers were not particularly adept in the language that we chose, which is Python, and that the engine that we chose, Pygame, wasn't able to support our creative vision for the game. So what ended up being created was this endless runner kind of rotational game that was a mishmash of some ideas that we had from previous prototypes, and in the end, despite being a producer, I wrote about 60% of the code, which is not what you would want from a project of this type. 
Now when we talk about what went wrong, more than a handful of things. The first major thing was the production style, and this was entirely on me. This is my fault. This is not, you know, any blame to go on the rest of the team, but being the only member of the production team with any real experience in, you know, game production at all before this, I should have known that we needed a much more structured production style. Instead, we went with a kind of open-ended, finish tasks as you want, structure the tasks however you want, no real priorities, just get it done. This works great for tiny teams, maybe one or two people, but for a team of six people, it was just not a smart way to go. And we found that people were working on tasks that didn't really contribute much to the final game, and instead were kind of like fluff. Um, the artists were doing great work, but a lot of their assets couldn't even end up in the game because we couldn't optimize. Some programming hiccups, the main one being uh, not having rotating sprites. So rotating sprites is a fairly easy thing to do. In Pi game, you can rotate by one degree. There's a command for that, no problem. Rotating around a point is a bit more complicated. You have to move the sprite back to the origin, rotate it by a degree, and then move it back the same distance along that new vector. Now, to me, that seemed pretty obvious. The programmer who was assigned the task, though, failed to do that over the course of a week, and as a result we ended up with nothing to show at our dry run prototype four days before the game was supposed to ship. We were still on that maze platformer idea, and we realized that just wasn't happening. We pivoted late in the game, and that led to some other issues, but I think probably the biggest problem with the game was the engine choice. If we had gone with mono game, we would have had a significantly easier time. Mono game is multi-threaded, it's optimized, it allows you to display multiple sprites on the screen with no issues, and more, more than all of that, it is just much better optimized. The performance would have been significantly better, the game would have run at a steady 60 frames per second, just would have been a much better experience overall. And yeah, the task management was also another problem. Again, going back to the production style, I didn't use Agile properly, we didn't use Scrum, we didn't use Kanban, we used none of these production styles that you would expect to use. So in short, everything went wrong. But despite all of that, I wouldn't consider this project a failure. I think that failing might be one of the best things that you can do as a game designer. You're going to make bad games in your career. You're going to make games that are just terrible from the get-go, that you really shouldn't have started on, that you thought were going to be the greatest thing ever but that just ended up turning out to be pretty bad in the end. But I think that that's the main takeaway, or the main lesson here. Failure, especially in game design, is a good thing. It's inevitable. You need to embrace it and learn from it and use it to make your next project even better. And I think you'll see from the next two projects that we have queued up for this series that yes, we learned a lot from this. We improved our design methodology. We checked in on tasks much quicker. We made sure that people were working on tasks that were prioritized. And overall, the next projects that we have were significantly better. Now, in the next episode, I'll be talking about my second project, Battle Bounce. And we'll be talking about game design documents and pitching. And then in my third video, which should be coming out sometime in the next two weeks, we'll be talking about the latest game that I finished, Outlord, and why knowing your engine inside and out can really help you make a better game. So thank you guys. I have been Cable. This is the Planetarium Panic Postmortem. If you guys have any questions or if you'd like to get a copy of the game for yourself, please let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do to release it. Thanks guys and bye bye